Hey everyone, in this video we are going to talk about what a database is. We've been using the term quite a bit throughout the class and we finally actually get to define what a database is. Now the textbook does misrepresent what a database is a little bit. Um, so I'm going to try to make some light corrections where I'm able to, but we're going to talk about what a database is. We're going to focus in specifically on something called relational databases. And I'm going to define all of those terms as they come up in our discussion. So I've talked a lot about databases holding onto data. And from that very, very brief description of what they do, you might think that it sounds a lot like what a spreadsheet does as well. The kind of things that you're building in Microsoft Excel, because those spreadsheets are holding a lot of data. They are holding st structured data in particular, where you have all these columns that describe attributes of what you are keeping track of. And then the rows are actual entities, actual records of those things that you're keeping track of. And indeed, both a spreadsheet and a database keep track of data. They are both meant to hold data. A spreadsheet holds data specifically involving a single theme. So maybe, you know, I have my participation log, which the theme of that spreadsheet would be sort of when students have actually participated in the class. I have the different sheets within my workbook in Excel where one sheet is student participation in class, right? The columns are, you know, week one, day one, week one, day two, etc. The columns are the actual days of class and the rows are the students in my class and every cell in there is keeping track of if that particular student has attended class on that particular day. That is the theme of that particular spreadsheet. Where databases differ from spreadsheets is that databases can hold data with multiple themes. So for example, um, maybe if I'm using a database to keep track of everything, I might have my participation log, but I might also be keeping track of grades. I might be keeping track of correspondence with students, both messages that students have sent to me and messages that I have sent to students, which actually can be a really important thing for an instructor to keep track of, especially for things like financial aid or things like, you know, making sure that there's not uh, some sort of financial aid based fraud going on. We have to keep track of a student's last day of accessing the class if we are, uh, if we have to drop them for the class for things like non-attendance or something like that. And using a database to keep track of student communications can actually be really important. Uh, having all of that information in one place rather than having it in sort of multiple places, like I'm looking at the Canvas gradebook, I'm looking at my email inbox and my Canvas inbox, all of that kind of stuff, that can make things a lot easier for me to keep track of my class. So that's where a database would be really useful, in particular for me as an instructor. A database can be useful for holding all of my class data with all those different themes. And you could argue that I could do all of this in one complicated Excel uh, workbook with multiple sheets, each one of those being multiple themes. And that's true to an extent for some of the types of data that are out there. But when you get into the really 
really wild types of databases that are able to hold pieces, unstructured data, things like photos and videos as actual you know, elements in that database that can get a little bit complicated. That is something that Excel might have a hard time supporting if it's able to support at all. So a database has a lot more functionality than something like Excel. Now I still haven't actually described what a database is, so I'll give you the definition. It's a self-describing collection of integrated records. Now a database will typically hold structured data. This isn't true for every single type of database, of course. There are databases that hold unstructured data. I mentioned the possibility that a database might hold pictures or videos, which are not structured data. Structured data, of course, being structured into columns and rows, like what we talked about in when we were getting into the idea of Microsoft Excel and all of that. Um, so yeah, a database typically has structured data. The columns uh, will also be known as fields and attributes. Those fields will describe entries in a database. Uh, like I had in my participation log that I showed all of you when I was introducing you to Excel, the columns were participation on week one, day one, week one, day two, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, if we have a database that has information about students enrolled in a particular class, columns might include things like your uh, student number, your last day of attendance, uh, you might have your major in there if you have a major declared, uh, and so on and so forth. Any of that, infor that useful information about a student that a professor might need to know when looking at, say, an attendance roster or looking and doing some class management through a database. So that would be what the columns are. The individual rows would also be known as records or entities. Those collect column entries for one particular entity. So a row in a database of students would actually be a particular student in a class, and you would have that one student's column entries. That would be that student's um, you know, student number, that student's major, that student's last day of attendance, and so on and so forth. And then you have a table or a file which groups similar rows. So a table in the idea of a student database that might group all the students that are in one particular section of CBiz 101. So that's the idea of structured data. This is kind of a bit of a review. We've talked about structured data before, but we're introducing a little bit of new terminology with this idea of the table being a collection of rows and columns that describe an entire, in the student example, an entire class's worth of students. Now the self-describing part of a database comes from the metadata. The metadata is data about data. And in this case, we're using metadata to describe database structure. So we'll have metadata in a database that for the tables that are contained in a database, that metadata will describe what each of those columns do as well as what that table is actually recording. So if I have a participation roster, the metadata for that table, that table containing all the participation stuff would say that this is a table that tracks student attendance in class, in physical class sections with every single column representing that student's participation on a particular day. The metadata would also describe the possible values that you might get in a particular column. So 
in my example, because I was putting in ones and zeros, the metadata would say that the possible values inside of this column would be a one and a zero. Now, what we have here is an example of a table. This also happens to deal with student information. Uh, this one lists a whole bunch of students for a class, giving their student number, their name, uh, and then grades on homework one, homework two, and the midterm. It displays the columns, which are also known as fields, the rows, which are also called records. They're also talking about characters, which are known as bytes, which um, is a little bit tricky. So we, we talked about bytes when we were talking about computer data. One byte is equal to eight bits. It is a eight digit binary number and a single byte actually contains enough uh, data to encode a single character, a single letter, like the letter Y or the number nine or something like that. Or at least it used to, but nowadays we use something called Unicode, which actually uh, every character takes up more than one byte nowadays. So that's not exactly accurate at this point in time. Uh, they include this because they had this whole metaphor where every column is a group of characters and then every row is a group of columns, information in a column, and then every table is a group of rows and then a database would be a group of tables but then with other stuff in it. That's kind of where they're what they're going with in here it it's not the most accurate regardless uh, this is just an example of a table and a database will have multiple tables as well as met metadata describing all of the columns inside of the tables that they contain assuming it's a database that actually c contains only structured data and we're kind of ignoring the unstructured data containing databases for the time being. A database that contains only structured data will have multiple tables and it will have metadata describing all of the columns in those tables. Now, something to note is that these tables, especially in a business setting, can be massive. They can have thousands or tens or hundreds of thousands of entries and they can have a lot of fields associated with them, uh, which can be really hard to work with when you have a smaller computer. You don't have something that's crazy powerful like a server or anything like that. A personal computer can't, may not be able to work with a huge data set, so these tables might be split into multiple tables. Another problem is that data might be recorded in a kind of fragmented way where not all of the data looks exactly the same as all of the other data. So things don't at first glance necessarily look like each other. And these problems are, make it hard to actually work with a database all at the same time. And the multiple tables kind of split up side of things, you'll be storing a whole bunch of them on your secondary storage on some kind of local or cloud storage. And then you'd be accessing one of the tables at a time to look at the information there. But then you might need to start looking at another table. So you have to close the one you're currently looking at, look at another table and then navigate through to find the uh, the record for the same entity that you were just looking at on the previous table and so on and so forth. And especially in the past when processing power and main memory size was a lot more limited, back when people didn't have nearly as much RAM as we do now, uh, this was a huge problem. So people had to innovate on the idea of a database. And those innovations are actually ones that we still use pretty frequently nowadays.
those aforementioned problems led to the idea of a relational database. So just like any other database, a relational database contains a group of tables, contains multiple tables containing their you know, structured data, and it contains metadata describing the database structure. However, what a relational database also contains is relationships among rows in tables. Since we're working with multiple tables inside of a database, uh, what people realize is that it would be really helpful to describe how those tables are related, how the different pieces of data stored in those tables are actually connected to the pieces of data stored in the other tables. And by doing that, you can really get a picture of how everything that you're storing inside of your database is connected. And this was really, really important. It made it a lot easier to work with this fragmented data that might not exactly be shaped as all the other tables that in the database, but it allowed you to actually still connect everything together. And this is what we call the relational model, the idea that databases might have multiple tables that while possibly describing different things themselves, are all somehow connected to each other. And there's other types of models out there that don't necessarily follow this. Um, and we're not going to get really into that kind of stuff in this video in particular, but this particular model, the relational model is very powerful. It has survived for decades and is still widely used today. So let's take a look at an example and see what the relational model is all about. So what we have here is an example of three tables within a database. The first table is this email table, which describes uh, emails that a professor of a particular class has received from students. Uh, the professor has labeled each email with a particular unique number, starting at one and going up, uh, also with the date of the email, the message inside of the email, and then the student number of the student who sent that email. You have the student table, which lists the student number of every student, and this is going to be a unique student number because it is, well, it is generated by the college to be a unique, in this case, four digit number. I guess the enrollments, the total enrollment of the college is rather small. So you have the student number and then the student name, the actual name of the student, and then their grades for each of their homeworks and their midterm and so on and so forth. That is the student table. And then finally, there's the office visit table, which has similar to the email num, it has a visit ID, the ID number of a particular visit by a student. I, I would imagine it works the exact same way where the first student to visit from that class gets the visit ID one, and then the second student, the second time a student visits from that class, I get a visit, that visit gets a number of two and so on and so forth. So there's a visit ID, there's the date, notes about the visit, and then the actual student number of the student who visited here. And now you might see these circles and lines connecting the actual um, student table and email table or student, uh, student table and office visit table right here. And these are the actual relationships between the tables. You can see the relationship between the office visit table and and the student table being that there is a student number column in that office visit table and you could actually use the student number you could look that up in the student table to get more information about the student and the same thing goes for the email table where you have you store the student number here and then you can follow the student number over to the student table in order to actually get more information about the student. 
So it prevents you from needing to do something like put the student's name and other information about the student inside of the email table. Instead, you only need to put the information relevant to email communication in the email table. And same thing with the office visit table is you only need to put information relevant to the specific office visits inside the office visit table. It also prevents a lot of repetition or redundant information or stuff like that. Because imagine if you had to put student information multiple times inside the office visit table and inside the email table. You can see that student 1325 has emailed multiple times. Imagine having to put the student number and name inside of this email table multiple times. So using the relational model, we're able to sort of consolidate our information into the areas where they are most necessary or most relevant. So you have the student table here. And if it were up to me, I would even break up the student table into a table that has, you know, just information about the student themselves, number, name, any other relevant information about the student that you might see on a faculty roll call or something like that, and then have a grades table with a student number, um, you know, using a student number so you could connect that back to the actual student table as well. That's how I would personally go about doing this. So I would increase the number of tables and consolidate that information into tables that it's most relevant to. But that's just how I would personally do it. Now, the reason why you're able to use the student number here, uh, instead of using the student name, is because we have this very unique student number. The uniqueness of the student number allows it to be used as this sort of lookup value in the student table. Uh, that's not necessarily guaranteed for names. It is very possible that two students would have the, fir the same first and last names, which would mean that putting a student's name in order to identify which student sent a particular email or visited the office at a particular time, that could be bad because you might get into this situation where you don't know which one of the students with that name actually sent the email or actually visited the office. So the uniqueness of the student number is really, really important here. And that actually is kind of what makes this whole thing work as well as it does. The fact that the student number is unique right here, and we refer to it as a key or a primary key. So the student number in student table is known as a key column, which identifies a unique row in a table. There's not going to be two, um, there's not going to be two rows with the student number value 1325 because that would, that would mean putting the student into the same class twice, which is not something that should be possible unless something has gone very wrong with the enrollment system. So we can be reasonably certain that we, the uh, student number will only appear once in this entire table. That's what makes it a key column, the student number column, a key column in student table. Notice that it's not a key column in student number because one student can send multiple emails just fine. That's totally okay. Um, the key column in email table is just the email num. And we know that this is going to be a key column because by design, the email num is unique. We start at one and increment the email number every time we receive an email. So the first email gets email number one, second email gets email number two, and so on and so forth. Date would not be a good key column because, um, you know, there might be multiple emails sent on the same day. Like for example, emails numbers two and three right here. Message also wouldn't be a good uh, key column, partly because it's possible for two students to accidentally send the exact same email message. And partially because if we were to then use, uh, if we were to then try to reference um, certain emails from a different table, 
using the message as the key column would be bad because then we're copying an entire email message into that column and that's just really unnecessary especially when we have our email number that works just fine similar thing for office visit the visit id would be the key column now it's possible to have multiple columns functioning as key columns in one table uh, maybe you have multiple values that are unique for every particular record that you have maybe none of the values are by themselves unique but the combination of two or more values actually does make it unique so that might be a case where you would want multiple key columns it's totally possible to have multiple key columns and the way you would reference that multiple key columns is by having multiple columns in other tables with those keys uh, those key values in there now in the student table you could take student number and student name together to be key columns but that wouldn't necessarily be necessary because student number already is guaranteed to be unique so also including student name in there uh, would just be redundant there is only one instance of every student number so the student number by itself is sufficient as a key column in the student table and it is sufficient to identify an individual student from other tables regarding this particular class i want to talk a little bit more about metadata uh, we talked about it being the thing that makes databases self-describing because they contain this metadata that describes aspects of the database. Uh, it is data that describes data. Uh, metadata is itself data, but it is information that describes the data that we hold in the database. Now, there's a couple examples of metadata in action. One example is a library. If you are familiar with looking up a book in the library to see if that library actually has a copy of the book, then you are in a sense familiar with using metadata in order to see if the library has a copy of the book in order to find where that copy of the book is located in the library, whether or not it's currently checked out and so on and so forth. I mean, nowadays uh, card catalogs tend to actually function as databases that describe the library's collection which is a whole thing to unpack but in the past a card catalog by itself was just a description of the books that were contained in the library and where those books could be found in the library specifically or i shouldn't say specifically because there's different cataloging systems depending on the different library system that you're working with um, many public libraries use the dewey decimal system. So what you could do is use a catalog to identify where a book actually is in the library and then find that book in the library. So that card catalog would be a form of metadata. It is data about the data contained within the library or it is a listing of the books that are contained in the library and how you can actually find those books. Another example is looking at the different file properties in Microsoft uh, File Explorer. So let me actually show you what I mean by that. All right, so this is my actual File Explorer in my videos folder. Uh, as you can see right here, I'm actually recording this particular clip right now. This is the scene that I had just recorded talking about file properties in Explorer. And we're going to actually take that scene and look at the file properties of that video clip. So very, um, if you will, very meta metadata. Regardless, uh, I'm going to click, right click that video and then click properties down here and you'll see all kinds of information about this file. And that is metadata. This is file metadata right here. We have things like the location of the file, the size, the creation date, modified date, and last accessed 
update that was um, five minutes ago when I was rewatching the video to double check exactly what I said in that clip. We also have uh, some juicy stuff under the details section like this because this is metadata contained within the actual file of the video. We have things like um, if I I can choose to set a title or subtitle for the video given that I'm just recording lecture material right now. I don't uh, set titles and subtitles for any of these clips, but these can be really useful for if you're if you have a movie file on your computer. Um, if you actually have a f video file that contains a movie or an episode of a TV show or something like that, this used to be a lot more common uh, back before streaming really exploded and became the most popular way of watching movies and TV shows and stuff like that. So that's actually why you have all of these, um, a, a lot of the reason why you have all of these pieces of metadata inside of the file is because people were expected to have files for movies and TV shows and maybe home produced videos and stuff all on their personal computers so that they could watch them. So, so yeah, you have things like descriptive pieces of metadata, title and subtitle, which are empty. You have the length, 10 seconds, frame width and height, uh, 1920 by 1080. This is a 1080p video. Uh, I'm recording at 30 frames per second, which means that there are 30 still images in the actual video file for every second that the video file is running. Uh, we have information about the video tracks here, just the encoding of the actual video. Um, information about the audio, the sample rate, this stuff isn't super important for our discussion. But yeah, all of this stuff is metadata. It is data. It is stored on our secondary storage in the same place as the actual video part of the video. And it is describing the actual video itself. So it is data describing data. It is metadata. So this is what metadata looks like on a database. And I want you to recall the database that we were looking at before with the three tables, the email table, the office visits table, and the student table. Now this metadata describes the email table. Metadata in this sense is going to describe the table as a whole, and you'll have multiple pieces of metadata for multiple tables. So in this case, we're looking at the metadata for the email table. You can see that the uh, fields for email num, date, message, and student number are all being described right here. Um, you also have a data type, which describes the type of the value that is actually going to go in there. Is it going to be just a regular number? In this case, uh, the student number would be a regular number uh, because it is just a four digit number. Um, would it be a date time? So specifically a um, something that would be formatted in the way that a date or time would be, whether or not they're actually putting in the date that an email was sent or it was received, a time that the email was received, maybe both, something like that. Um, so that is another type of data that they can use here. This auto number, I actually believe refers to the fact that, um, you know, they're automatically assigning the number one to the first email, the number two to the second email, the number three to the third email, and so on and so forth. That constraint on the fact that this is, um, numbered based on the order in which that email was received makes it an auto number. And then long, long text just means that this is an email message. It could be pretty long, it could be lengthy. So the type of it is long text. Now, uh, 
Specifically, we have the date field highlighted right here. Um, oh, that uh, you have the description of the field as well. This just gives a very basic explanation of what that field means. So what does email num mean in the student in the email table? Well, it is the uh, primary key in this case. The values are provided by access because it is the order in which those emails are received. Uh, the date field name uh, specifically refers to the date and time that the message is recorded. Um, message, they'll, you can see from the description that it is the text of the email and the student number refers to a foreign key to the row in the student table. Foreign key specifically meaning this refers to a value that is in a key column in the student table. So you could use this as a key value to reference the exact student that this email was sent by in this case. The field properties I won't really get too much into. Um, you have a little more details and control over things like the actual format of the data, the way in which the data is displayed in the actual table, uh, default values, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we're not going to worry about that right now. Mostly the idea is that metadata is just data describing data. So in this case, we have all of this data right here in this table, this entire table is data that describes the data in the email table. In short, metadata tells us exactly what a database contains. Well, that is the introduction to databases. In the next uh, video, we're going to talk about database management systems, which actually, well, manage the databases that we work with. So. Yeah, thank you for watching.